Amen. Praise God. Mind if I remove this here and use this? All right. Praise God. Thank you for that welcome. Amen. Are you glad to be a Christian this morning? Amen. We've got a few excited here this morning. Praise the Lord. I really enjoyed that praise and worship. I'll tell you, I want to first thank David and this church for having me back here. To I used to go to church here, have, but having me back to preach on Sunday Easter morning is uh, quite the blessing. And I appreciate that. And this place will always hold a special, special place in my heart. And the reason being is because this is where I really got saved. This is where I really found the Lord. This is where I really found out that I had a calling on my life to preach the gospel. This is where I really got a hold of the Lord. And so uh, to be back here and to minister unto you all in this congregation is uh, a blessing. So I appreciate it very much. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. We no longer have to go back, Brother Matt, and look for him in that grave or, or like many did that morning when they went there to look for him because he's not there any longer. He's no longer in the grave, but he's risen, he's alive, and sitting on the right hand of the Father. Praise God. I want to preach to you this morning on, if I was going to title my message, it would be Loving Servants, which is what we need to be. You might want me to preach on the cross and the resurrection, and I'm going to share a little bit about that, but I've got to follow the leadership of the Spirit of God and, and preach you what He's put on my heart this morning. And like I said, that's to be a loving servant as our Heavenly Father was. As He roamed this earth, He was a servant, but He was our Savior. Amen. But I want to, I want to tell you this morning that our ability or our, the way that we show love is typically shaped by our experience of love. Or in other words, the reason why we might show somebody love is because maybe they loved us or they were compassionate towards us. And sometimes when people treat us wrong, we don't really want to love them or be very compassionate to them, the fleshly part of us. But that's not so much the way Jesus was because he loved unconditionally. He loved regardless if somebody was rude to him, regardless if somebody treated him wrong, he loved them. And so I want to preach to you this morning on being loving servants. And we can really see this come to life in John chapter 13. And if you've got your Bibles and want to go there and find that, we're going to start in John chapter 13 and verse 1. But we can see that come to life in this chapter as he washes his disciples' feet, including the feet of Peter, who was going to deny him three times, including the feet of Judas, who was his betrayer that sold him out for a small amount of money, including the feet of the disciples that all betrayed him and left him and forsook him as he was taken into custody. The Lord got to dealing with me on this message this morning, and, and I thought, my, my, where am I at in my walk with God that I could be willing Brother Eddie, to get down on my knees and wash the feet of somebody that betrayed me. To wash the feet of those that called themselves my friends, but yet forsook me when it mattered. And so I got to studying this, and it really checked me. And if any ministers are in the house this morning, you know when God puts a message on your heart, it deals with you first. Before you can get up here and deliver it to the body of Christ, you got to make sure you're in check, and you got to make sure you're abiding by what you're preaching. Amen. And and I thought about this as he was washing his disciples' feet, and it's quite humbling to think that our Savior, I'm talking about the King of kings. I'm talking about the Lord of lords this morning. I'm talking about the first and the last. He said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm your Redeemer. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm talking about the One, the King of kings above all kings. It's quite humbling to think about how he stooped down and humbled himself, Brother Scott, and washed the feet of those that treated him wrongly. The world would tell you not to do that. This world would tell you, oh, they don't deserve that. They don't deserve your love. They don't deserve your compassion. But praise God, we're not abiding by the world's standards, but we're abiding by what the Word of God tells us. And this, if we've got this on the inside of our heart and we're reading this daily and we're feasting on this Word, then we're not going to abide by what the world thinks we should do. We're going to be applying this Word to our life. Praise the Lord. But I want to tell you, washing the guest's feet was a job for a household servant, or in other words, a slave for a matter of uh, words. But when the guests arrived, they would wash their feet. But when we read this, you'll see that Jesus, he wrapped a towel around him as the lowliest slave would do. And he began to gather these things so that he could wash his disciples' feet. Amen. And if Jesus 
who I'm talking about is our Savior, that made it possible for us to have eternal life in heaven, to be reunited with God the Father if he stooped down and was humble enough to wash his disciples' feet. How about you and I this morning? How about you and I? Praise the Lord. You may say, well, I'm not Judas. I've never rejected God. I've never rejected Jesus like Judas did. I'm not like Peter, and I've not denied him. Oh, I beg to differ this morning because you and I are Judas. I'm going to get down here and just preach with you for a minute. You and I are Peter. You and I are the one that sent Jesus to the cross because of our sin. You may say, well, I, I wasn't in that position, Brother Zach. You may not have been in that position exactly, but one way or another, we have all rejected Christ. We have all messed up. We have all sinned. We've all, I said the Word of God tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we have all been in that position, Brother David, and we are the ones, and it's our sin that Jesus went to the cross so that we could be redeemed. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a hand clap of praise. He deserves it this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Even though Jesus knows me, even though Jesus knows you this morning, Brother Dean, He knows you to your deepest core. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your strengths. He knows your likes. He knows your dislikes. He knows all these things about you. He knows when you're going to succeed. And he knows when you're going to fail. But even though, this gets me excited, even though he knows this about us, he would still be willing to wash your feet. He would still be willing to stoop down, even though he knows that in our darkest pit, in the mistakes that we've made and who we've become, and even though we're trying to live this godly life, we may slip up. He would still wash our feet with the disciples that day. Amen. Praise God. Are you at John chapter 13, verse 1? Amen. Would you stand with me as I read the Word of God this morning? It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour was come, that He should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved His own which were in the world, He loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and ye well say, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. I'm going to say that again. If you know these things, happy, or in other words, blessed are ye if you do them. I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but the, that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Would you help me pray? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, and this privilege to be in your house once again, Lord, to read this Word of God, to bring it to the body of Christ. I just ask, Lord, that as we minister this Word, I pray that you'd anoint me. We know the Word of God is already anointed. It needs no more anointing, Lord, for it has what it needs to do to accomplish what you've sent it to, Lord. But I, the vessel this morning, needs the anointing. I ask that you would anoint my lips and my tongue to preach this word as you would see fit for the kingdom of God, no more, no less. And we just give you the honor and the praise and the glory for who you are in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen.
Praise the Lord. I'm going to back up a little bit this morning. I always like to kind of read my scripture that I'm going to preach to you and then try to break it down. But if we back up to verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. You know that Jesus loves you and that he's going to love you unto the very end. Did you know that he's such a, a gentleman that he will love us even into the very pits of hell? You say, well, what do you mean, Brother Zach? Well, what I'm saying is if you so choose not to serve him and accept him as your Savior and Lord, he will love you unto the very end of your life until you miss heaven and make hell is what it will be. He will love you unto that very place, but praise be to God, you don't have to go there. Praise God, he's made a way of escape of that place. All we have to do is just believe within our heart and confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is the Lord and begin to live a life that's pleasing to him according to the word of God. And we don't have to go there, but we can escape from that place. But praise the Lord, it says here is that when Jesus knew that his hour was come, Jesus lived his life, Brother Dean, for the anticipation of this hour. He lived his life up to this point, 33 and a half years until he come to this point because this was his hour where things were going to take place and things were going to be accomplished so that you and I could go to that place with him. Praise be to God. He had a purpose for leaving his throne. He did not leave it, Pastor David, for no reason. He left the throne of God so that he could accomplish something for you and I that you and I could not accomplish. There's nothing inside of us good enough for us to make heaven, which is why we needed a Savior that was without spot. Brother Matt, but was without blemish but praise be to God, he came to be the sacrifice for us all because there's none good within us. It said that our righteousness is as a filthy rags. Amen, but he had a purpose. Amen. I want to ask you this morning, what's your purpose? Do you know where Jesus is in your life? Do you know what purpose you have? Do you know when your hour has come? Or in other words, I'm asking, are you close enough to the Lord that you know when to speak? Are you close enough to the Lord that you know when to be quiet? Are you close enough to the Lord to know whether, Brother David, he is in something or whether he isn't? Are we that close with the Lord like Jesus was in anticipation for this hour? He was prepared for this. I want to ask you this morning, are we prepared? Are we close to the Lord? Do we know what our purpose is? Amen. Verse 2 here it says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now some manuscripts read this as this, these few words, supper being ended, or in other words, as supper was now in progress. And we know that, that, and that makes a lot more sense as I was studying this because the following verses and from verse 12 all the way to 30, we know that it wasn't ended. We know that it was just getting started and they were coming together. But we read here, that the point I'm trying to make to you is that supper was just getting started as he was going to wash his disciples' feet and then they were going to eat together. They were going to fellowship with one another. And we know here that Judas, as it was saying there, that the devil having now been put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, we know that he chose to betray Jesus. We know that it was very evident that the enemy came against him and tempted him and put these things within his heart. But it's up to you and I what we do with the thoughts. It's up to you and I to do with these things that the devil would try to influence us with. The devil did not make him do this, but he chose to betray Jesus Christ. But you and I may face a very similar battle where the enemy is coming against us with all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of feelings, all kinds of things. But it's up to me and it's up to you whether we take a hold of them and rebuke them or we take a hold of them and accept them. The word tells tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I'll tell you, when I was early on in this thing, I didn't understand all that. I was having all kinds of thoughts coming against me and I didn't understand what to do and I had to get hold of some people that knew what they were talking about that had a relationship with the Lord to tell me, you've got to get a hold of this word. And when you get a hold of this word, you can use it as a sword because it is a two-edged sword. Amen. It said it would pierce down even into the dividing asunder of soul and spirit into the bone and marrow of our bodies. Praise God. So it would defeat things when we come against it, but casting down and getting a hold of those thoughts. In verse 3, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Amen. Notice here it said that, things were, that all things was given into his hands. Amen. Now, this wasn't something Jesus just came to know right here. 
Brother Mitch, he knew these things, that he had the power that God had given him. This wasn't just an epiphany that he had, amen, because previously in John chapter 3, verse 35, it says that the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Amen. And I believe that in this moment, Brother Eddie, that it was important for Jesus to remember or remind himself or just bring back to his remembrance that the Father had given him all things within his hands, that he had power over all things, even though that he was about to go through all these things that he was about to face to go to the cross. It was good for him to remind himself, remember, God has given me this power. All things are within my hands. Amen. And you know what? He could have chose when it got tough. And when the whippings on his back were unbearable or when the crown of thorns were put on his head or when they nailed him to the cross, Brother Dean, he could have called all the angels to take him off of that cross because it said that all the power was in his hands. But praise be to God, he did not give up. Praise be to God that he went all the way for you and I. But too many of the times we don't want to go all the way because it takes so much effort and it may be painful and it may be excruciating, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ went all the way for you. He went all the way for me and I'm excited to say that he's living on the inside side of me, which gives me the strength to carry on because Zach can't do it. My flesh cannot do this thing. I have to draw strength from the Father and through the Spirit of the living God to help me get through this because all power is in His hands. And if I'm walking hand in hand with Him, praise God, I've got the power too. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'll tell you, it's exciting to be a Christian. It's a blessed thing to be a Christian because you know where your help comes from. You're not going to find the strength and the help that you need to make it through this life in the world. You will not find it in your job. You will not find it even in your wife. You will not find it in your friends or in your family, but the strength you need will be found in God. I'm not saying that your friends and family and wife and those things aren't all good and dandy because they're great and they're a blessing from the Lord, but what we need is from heaven. It's from Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. When Jesus went to that cross, he went as a victor. He didn't go as a victim. You and I would have went as a victim because it was our sin that he was paying the penalty for. It was our sin. It wasn't Jesus. He was a victor, not a victim. Praise God. Verse 4, it says, He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Amen. When I was studying this, a Bible scholar by the name of Trench is his last name. He said, John's account reads... Very, very particularly, he said, it's almost like as if he was an eyewitness, which he was as an eyewitness, he watched these things with wonder and suspense and short sentences. And as we read these next few verses, just watch how John brings these things together. He said, he riseth from supper. It's almost like he's going back over this event that happened. He gets up from supper and he lays lay aside his garments. And then he takes a towel and he girds himself. Amen. No matter how much time had passed between these events that had taken place, John was just bringing it right back into remembrance like it just happened. Do you take your nice clothes and go work on a pickup or go out in the field and farm or or turn wrenches? No, I'm not going to wear this out there because I don't have very much of it and I don't want to mess it up. Amen. And it's expensive. Amen. So what I'm saying is, is before you go to get dirty and you know you're going to have to do something that may, may soil you, you take some clothes off. You take some garments off. And so Jesus was about to clean his disciples' feet. And so he began to shed some layers. He began to take off his outer clothing. And he began to get down there and he got a towel around him. Now I'll tell you what. It's time for you and I to gird ourselves up and get busy with the Lord. In other words, what I'm saying is it's time to to start taking this relationship that we have seriously and gird ourselves and understand that there's work to be done. We may have to roll up our sleeves. We may have to take off this coat. I might have to take it off here in a minute, but praise be to God. What I'm telling you is Jesus was preparing himself to do a task. And a lot of the times we've got too much baggage on us and we've got to start taking some things off before we can do anything for the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God. But there's a special blessing here for those that not only agree that humble service is Christ's way, but also who does it as a part of their own life. It's a great thing for you to agree that being a humble servant is a good thing and it's, it's something that we need to have in our life. But if all you do is agree with me, it's not going to do anything for you. But if you take this word that God's given me and the word that's in this Bible and apply it to your life and understand that we must be a a humble servant, then it's a great thing to believe it and also apply it. Amen. 
Verse 5, it goes on to say, And after that he poureth water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Amen. At this moment, I believe there's some deep meaning right here that we need to dig into. But Jesus did something that I believe probably was what the disciples thought. What in the world is he doing? This is a servant's job. You're our Savior. You're the King of Kings. You're our Lord that's going to redeem. You're, the, you're, you're everything that we have, and you're stooping down before us to wash our own feet. So I believe they may have thought there's some crazy things going on around us, and sometimes we may think whatever we are facing is indifferent or it's not the way it should be, but praise God that our Heavenly Father says that my ways are above your ways, my thoughts are above your thoughts, and, and what He has in store, even if it seems indifferent to you, does not negate what He's doing in your life. Don't run away from difference in your life because it may be God using you to mold you into who, you want you to, who He wants you to be. Amen. But He began to do this job of the lowliest servant in the household. He began to wash their feet and He gave Himself completely to this work, what He was about to do. And I'm going to explain that in a minute, but He gave Himself completely. How about you this morning? Are you giving yourself completely to the Lord? Are you completely devoting yourself unto God? Are you just coming on a Wednesday and then coming Sunday morning and Sunday evening because you know it's church day? Because you know you're supposed to be there. Come on. I'm talking, these are all real thoughts this morning. Just because it's Sunday morning and it's Easter, you think, well, a lot of people that don't normally come to church have entered into the church because they think, well, it's Easter. I better go to the church. <sighs> We need not just to come to church when we think it's important or when it's easy for us to come to church, Brother David, but we need to come to church every time that we can when those doors are open because we're going to receive something here at Living Hope Assembly or wherever church it is that you go to that you're not going to receive by staying home. You may, amen. As Brother David used to say, amen, amen. I was, I, the reason I said it like that is because we just went through a period where we just were staying home a lot. Went through COVID, and now a lot of people are thinking you can still stay at home and get what you can here in God's house, and I, I disagree with that. Because you can get a blessing from, from home. Don't get me wrong. Jesus is wherever you are. As he said, if you will draw nigh to me, I will draw nigh to you. It could be on the back 40 somewhere out in the farm. It could be driving a truck down the road, Brother Jeremy. It could be at your job. It could be anywhere. But what I'm telling you is we need to start appreciating the house of God and honoring it and coming to church when the doors are open, even when you're tired, even when you've worked 40 hours a week, even when you're struggling, even when you don't feel the best, even when you've got a headache, even when you go through these things, we need to be here because we're going to receive something that we're not going to get anywhere else. Praise the Lord. But when I get back here to this, he gave himself completely. I want us to give ourselves completely to the Lord if we're not already. But he took this towel and he girded himself, and then he poured the water into a basin. You know, he could have had a, a disciple do all this prep work for him to make his point. He could have. He could have had a disciple to get all these things ready for the foot washing, but he gave himself completely to serving his disciples. I'm talking about Jesus this morning. He gave himself completely to serve, to stoop down. and get, I believe he probably got down on his knees. I believe he, they were sitting down somewhere and he just began to wash them. I'm talking about, I'm talking about our heavenly, our, our godly father that sent his only begotten son to earth so that we could be set free and saved. I'm talking about Jesus this morning that was, cross, that was crucified and put on that cross for our benefit, stoop down low. He thought it was important to show his disciples something about being a servant. But in this moment in Jesus' life, even though he knew what was before him, he knew that he was going to die an agonizing and very painful and torturous death. He knew that these things were before him, but yet he was still thinking about somebody else. Even though I'm busy, even though I'm working, <clears throat> even though I know that I've got a stressful week ahead of me, even though I know that I've got all these things ahead of me, how much am I thinking about my brother or my sister? Because sometimes, and I'm guilty, I'm going to tell you, I'm not perfect. God just decided to use me to, to preach to you. That doesn't make me any, any more perfect, any more better than you. This message goes from the pulpit to the back door. Amen? But I'm guilty to get busy and go through the day and I thought, my goodness. I've not prayed for so-and-so. I've not thought about so-and-so. I've not called so-and-so. 
Amen. Praise the Lord. Lord, help us to think about somebody else. As Jesus was thinking about his disciples, even though he was about to be crucified. <clears throat> Verse 6, it says, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. <clears throat> you know, sometimes, as I said earlier, we don't fully understand what Jesus is doing in our life. We don't fully grasp it sometimes when we are seeing it with our carnal eyes because you and I can't see in the next 30 seconds. I'm going to share this with you. I wasn't going to. I didn't have this in my notes. But I feel like the Lord just brought it to my memory. I'm thankful that the Lord knows and can see ahead of time. Even though I didn't understand why I didn't get that job years and years back because the interview went really well. And I thought I answered all the questions properly, and I was dressed nice, and, and everything went good. I felt really good about it, but I didn't get the job. And this was long, long ago. And I thought, Lord, what in the world? How come I didn't get that job? I thought it would be a great, great job to have. It was somewhere where I wanted to work. It was good pay. It was good this, and it was good that. Well, about six, eight months went by, and they shut down. If I would have got what Zach wanted, I would have quit my job that was paying me well, and then got this other job, Brother Matt, and then would have lost it again and would have been jobless. But praise be to God, I've got somebody that's got my best interest at heart. You may not get that promotion. You may not get that new job. You may not get that vehicle that you're wanting. You may not get these things that you're wanting, but praise God, he can see down the line. You and I cannot see in the next week. We cannot see what's going to go on here after this service. But praise the Lord, he knows what's good for us. And if we will just trust the Lord and know that he has our best interest at heart and can walk with him hand in hand and just believe that, then we're going to be in a better place. Instead of mulling around in the, woe is me, oh, I didn't get it, I, I, I'm not going to church tonight, I don't want to shake anybody's hand, you know how that goes. Let's get that stuff, that garbage out of here. Let's rebuke that stuff. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. And in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Did you notice there it said, lean not to your understanding because your understanding is flawed. Your understanding is not where it needs to be, but just trust in me, your heavenly father, because I'm perfect. I know what you need, but he said, I know what you have need of before you even ask. If he knows what I have need of before I ask, some people say, well, what in the world should I ask for? Because the Bible goes on to say, you have not because you ask not. So yes, he knows what we have need of, but go ahead and ask him in faith and believe him. And then he will give you that thing if it's according to his will. Amen. That's right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 8 says, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Have you ever been there? You tell, try to tell God no? I remember when I received a message over me, he said, Preach and prophesy. Father. Me? Like you're talking to me? Yeah, I'm, you're the only one getting prayed for right now, son. Yeah, preach and prophesy. And I thought, my, I don't know. That's a lot to take on. I remember when it bothered me to get up here and, and lead testimony service. I remember when it bothered me to get up in class and do a public speaking, speaking uh, event. But God was just slowly preparing me. God slowly preparing you for where he wants you. You're exactly where you're at for a reason this morning. You're not here by chance. You didn't come on Easter Sunday by chance. You're exactly where you're at for a reason because God is slowly preparing you for where he wants you. Amen. But Peter, he says, you shall never wash my feet. And perhaps Peter thought, well, we've all missed the point here. As Jesus is trying to prep and wash our feet, We've all missed it, all the disciples. Maybe what Jesus is, the point he's trying to make is that he wants us to speak up and proclaim, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet because you're much too great and we're much too unworthy for you to do this. Maybe that's what was going through his mind when he said, never, you're not washing my feet. I don't believe it was a, a rude statement like, I don't want you touching me, but it, I believe it was from a standpoint of, but you're, you're the Savior. You're our heavenly father. You, you are this, and you're wanting to wash my feet. I'm, I'm just a servant. I'm just your disciple doing this, helping you wherever I can. And he said, you'll, you'll never wash my feet. 
But he, Peter was clearly uncomfortable with this situation. And it wasn't that his feet were so special, like I said. It wasn't that he was so much better or anything like that, like that but it was the fact of who was washing the feet that made him feel uncomfortable. How would you feel if Pastor David said, Matt, come up here. I'm going to wash your feet. Ooh. You're not washing my feet, Pastor. I'm washing yours. We've got to humble ourselves. Because if we're not careful, and I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I mean, just wait for that. I don't want to get ahead of myself, praise the Lord. But we need to receive whatever it is the Lord has for us, amen. <clears throat> Peter had to accept this from Jesus because if he wouldn't have accepted the humble uh, servantship that Christ was trying to show him, for one, he would have missed his point. And two, we go on to see that in verse 9 it says, or, or at the end of verse 8, I'm sorry, and Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. So when he said that, it kind of changed his mindset. He said, well, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you have no part of me because I'm trying to show you something. I'm trying to teach you something, son. And that kind of changed his mindset a little bit here. But if we don't accept the humble service of Jesus to cleanse us, we have no part with him. If we don't allow him to come in and, and clean house in this body and in this spirit and in this soul, then we don't have a part in heaven with him. But if you allow him to come in and humble you and clean you up, it may be from the top, and it is from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. It's not just going to be one part of you, but if you allow him to come in and clean you, then you have a part with him in heaven. Then you have a place with him in heaven if you let him be the Lord of your life. But if we let pride get in the way and prevent us from receiving that cleansing, we're going to miss it. Let's just get the pride out of the way. <clears throat> verse 9, it says, Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. I believe, as I was studying this, I believe some people interpret this verse very differently. I believe some of it look at it from a perspective that Peter was trying to tell Jesus what to do. I believe that people look at this as Peter was uh, trying to say, you're doing too much. Uh, well, you're doing too little right now because all you want to do is just wash my, or you're doing too much because you want to wash my feet. And then when he said, well, if you don't let me, then you've got no part with me. And then he said, as we read, Jesus saith unto him, he that is, or verse 9, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So that kind of changed his mindset. And he said, not just my feet, but also every, every other part of my body. If you're just going to wash my feet and you say I don't have any part with you, then just cleanse me everywhere, Lord. I believe some people will, when we're looking at that, that Peter was saying, well, you're doing too little and now you're doing too much and I'm trying to tell you what to do, but I don't believe that's what I got when I was studying this. I believe that when I was reading this and studying this, that Peter was realizing he had need of this cleansing after Jesus said what he did to him. And then he was like, Lord, not just my feet, not just my feet, but also my hands and my head. So in other words, when you know that Christ is in the cleansing game, when you know that when he comes inside of you, it's just going to make you a better person. Your Lord, don't just give me a little touch of you. Don't just come in and just give me you know, a little bit of your presence. I want the whole thing. He said, would I not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so great that you'd not have room enough to contain? I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't just want something coming out from the spout where it just barely fills my cup up. I want something to open up the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing that I don't even have have room enough to contain, that I can't put it in a jar, that I can't set it to a side, but Lord, I just can't even handle all that you have for me. That's the kind of blessing that I want from the Lord. I don't just want, as they say, a little dabble, do you? I want the whole thing. As much as I can handle, Lord. But I believe that's how Peter was, was feeling there. You, can, you may disagree with me, and if that's the case, we'll talk about it after service. Amen. Praise God. But sometimes, you know, you can show a servant's heart by accepting other people's service towards you. I didn't think about this when I was studying. I thought, that makes a whole lot of sense. I can show that I am a servant by allowing somebody else to serve me, just as I can show that I'm a servant by serving them. <clears throat> Because if, we if we only serve and refuse to be served, then I believe that it shows that we've got a little bit of pride in there. I believe if we just want to serve people and do everything else, but yet we can't ever stand back and let them serve us, I believe that's saying, 
well, hey, I can do all this for you, but I don't want you doing anything for me because I'm dignified and I am who I am and this and that and whatever ungodly reason that we have. But we can show that we are a servant by not only serving, but also being served and accepting that. There's a quote that I found that said, man's humility doesn't begin with the giving of service. It begins with the readiness to receive it. I'm going to say that again because I don't know if you got it. Man's humility doesn't begin with the giving of service. It begins with the readiness to receive it. Praise the Lord. Because if you go on this whole, your whole life just, be, just serving and never being served, you're going to get exhausted. If you go on this whole thing and you're, you know, you're doing all this for the church and you're preaching and you're teaching on Sunday and Wednesday and doing all these things and you never allow somebody to serve you, you're going to get wore out. God has a plan and a purpose for not just serving, but for also being served. Verse 10, it says, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not, to, not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. Amen. Verse 12, and it says, So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? So I believe Jesus wanted to ensure what he just shot them or whatever he just showed them was understood correctly that they understood what just happened because it meant something. He wanted to ensure that they understood it that what just took place. He said, "Do you understand what just happened?" Because Jesus's goal for his disciples was to carry on his mission when Jesus was gone. His goal for his disciples were to continue to, to share the gospel to whoever it was that they come in contact with in this world where they were serving God, serving each other, or serving whoever it was that they were preaching the gospel. He wanted them to understand the thought of servantship and humbleness because Jesus knew here shortly I'm going to leave. Here shortly I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to be taken away and I'm going to return to the Father. So I want you to understand this is what he was telling them. I'm going to lack for a better words here. Verse 13, you call me master and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. So Jesus, he's encouraging the commitment of his disciples to him. He's saying, yes, you call me, you call me teacher and Lord, and that's correct. They recognize him as their teacher and Lord because there was nobody else, Brother Dean, in their life that could teach them and show them the things that Jesus was. That's why when any minister gets up behind the pulpit, we need to honor what it is they have to say as long as it lines up with what this word says because it's coming from heaven. If they prayed and they sought God and they got a message, it come down from the Father and it dealt with them to preach it to you. So we need to understand and respect what it is that's coming out from the minister of God. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. He said, you call me master and Lord and you say, well, for I am. Jesus isn't just your father. He's not just your teacher. Amen. He's not just our friend. He's not just your ever-present help in a time of trouble. He's not just our peacemaker. He's not just your counselor. He's not just your comforter. He's anything that you need him to be. He can be your mechanic because he's been mine before when I didn't know what to do. I said, Lord, you're just going to have to help me and I didn't even have to do anything. He just fixed it. Amen. He can be whatever it is that you need him to be. If you're fatherless, he can be your father. If you're husbandless or spouseless, he can be your spouse. He can be whatever it is that you need. Amen. Verse 14, I'm getting close. Hang with me. It says, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash one another's feet. Amen. So Jesus commanded his disciples here to show the same humble sacrificial love that he had showed unto them. This doesn't just go for the disciples. This goes for everybody that calls Jesus teacher and Lord, which include you and I today. You call Jesus Lord, don't you? So this message is for you. You can't, you can't leave here this morning and say, oh, well, that was for the person behind me, because this is for all of us. From the pulpit all the way to the back, this is for every one of us. Praise the Lord. But we should be willing to wash the feet of all those people that we come in contact with, whether they be your friends or if you have any, whether they're your enemies. We ought to be willing and to be so humble and be such a servant that we wash all the feet of those that we come in contact with. And you're probably thinking, well, Brother Zach, I can't just be washing everybody's feet at work. Now, I'm not just talking physically about washing feet. I'm talking about serving them. I'm talking about doing whatever you can to be a witness to them, to let your light shine, to love them as Christ has loved you. Amen. 
It could mean literally. I've been part of a foot washing before. It was very humbling. I'd never been a part of that before. It was a little different, but it was a great experience. It could mean literally, but I, what I mean is find ways to serve somebody. That could mean opening the door for somebody in the morning. And as hard as it is, and when you're in a hurry, it's hard to prefer somebody in line before yourself. But serving somebody could mean, hey, you know what? You go right ahead. If you're, you kind of come up to the register at the same time, you say, go ahead and take my spot. You go right ahead. It could mean a bunch of different things to you. You know what being a servant means. Amen. It might mean taking on more work at your job, even though it's getting close to 5 o'clock and you're going to get home late and miss supper and it's going to be cold. But if that means helping take the workload off of somebody else to kind of give them some relaxation and peace, that's serving. Amen. We need to find a way to serve. Praise God. Verse 15, it says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Amen. Don't be another person that criticizes people with dirty feet. I see this a lot, and you see it too, that somebody calls themselves a Christian, but yet they're gossiping, and they're talking down on somebody because they're so sinful and dirty that they don't even deserve to be here, kind of talk. And that's so far from God. We shouldn't have any part of it. I mean, don't be another person that criticizes people with dirty feet. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not talking about those with actually dirty feet. I'm talking about those with lives that has been sin stained from the world. I'm talking about those that's dabbled with the world and let the devil in their life and they're filthy and they're dirty and they're sinful, just like you and I were before we come to an altar and got saved. So don't be one to criticize somebody else about being dirty. How about we just go and begin to foot wash them and help clean them up? And what I mean is maybe not physically, but let your light shine to them to a point where they ask you about the hope that lies within inside of you so that you can be ready to give an answer of that hope which is Jesus Christ don't criticize them for being dirty just love them and it'll open the door for you to tell them about Jesus which is who is going to clean them up I'm grateful that he cleaned me up I'm grateful that now I don't talk like I used to I don't go to the places that I used to I don't act the same way that I used to I had people say when I first got saved I kind of miss the old Zach you know how much that hurt because they were my friends I thought they said that they'd be with me all the way to the end. That they'd, they'd, I'd, they'd be there for me if I ever needed anything. But when they told me, I missed the old Zach, that hurt. But it's at that moment that I should be humble enough to even wash their feet when they say things that hurt me, when they say things to come against me, when they do things that I don't agree with. Amen. But wash the feet of those that you're around. Amen. Lead them to Jesus who can actually clean them up. You can plant the seed. Somebody else will come by and water, but God will give the increase. Praise the Lord. If we're going to wash somebody's feet, we need to be careful with what temperature we're washing it with. If you're going to wash somebody's feet, be careful because the same temperature used on somebody else may not work for someone that just got in this thing. I mean, because you might be on fire for God. You might be excited about who you're serving, and you come in there, and you, all you've got is something just boiling hot, and it's going to clean them, but it's going to burn them, and it's going to hurt them too. So we've got to be careful with what kind of temperature we're using to help clean people up. Like I said, you're not doing the cleaning, but what I mean is you get what I'm saying this morning. Ephesians 5.26, it says, that he might sanctify, sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So I'm talking about your attitude. I'm talking about your demeanor this morning that we use towards people and how we reach them. But that's how we were reached, and that's how Jesus cleaned, up, cleaned us up, was by sanctifying us and cleansing us with the washing of the water by the word. Praise the Lord. The blood of Christ. Just one drop can make even the vilest sinner clean. Brother Dean, I was in a place before I really got into this thing where I was coming to church, but I, really, I was there in a pew, but I, I was physically there, but I wasn't there spiritually, if you know what I mean. I was in a place where I was so dark and I was so filthy and I had so much pride and so much arrogance in my life and my family may say, well, my goodness, I didn't know all about this. I'm sorry, I'm just preaching to you and telling you the truth this morning. But I was in such a dark place, Pastor, that with Jesus' blood when he came down and cleansed me, it didn't take a whole bunch of it because I was such a vile sinner. All it took was one drop from Jesus' blood and it made me clean. So I'm telling you this morning, Jesus is our cleaner, amen, but he might use you to help prepare them to get them to the law laundry mat, so to speak, which is here so that he can get us cleaned up. Amen. Verse 16, it says, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. So if Jesus, who's our master and Lord, served with this humble manner, then it's even more important for you and I, who's not perfect, who's not made heaven yet, it's even more important for you and I to serve in this same manner as well. Would you agree? Amen. Amen. Because Jesus, who is perfect and without sin, still acted this way. You know what being a Christian means? It means to be Christ-like. When you say, I'm a Christian, you're telling somebody that I'm Christ-like. You're not telling them that you're perfect like Jesus, but you're trying to be. It means that you're acting as Jesus did. And guess what? Jesus served. Even though he's above all, in all, and through all, he still served and humbled himself to help wash their feet. Amen. There's no big eyes and little use in this thing. We're all in this thing together. Would you agree this morning? Amen. He said, if I've done this, then you do it too. <clears throat> Verse 17, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Praise the Lord. This is what I like to call a conditional scripture because the reward is based off how you and I respond to this, this verse here. The theory of being humble, so the thought of you being humble and being a servant for God and all those things, you might think, well, that's a, that's a good thing, Zach, that you're talking about. But the theory isn't worth very much. The thought in your mind of you doing that isn't worth very much. It's a good thing for you to start working towards it. But the practice of being a humble servant and actually applying it to your life is worth a whole lot more. You actually doing these things that we're preaching about this morning is worth a whole lot more than just talking about it. Amen? Verse 18, it says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come that when it has come to pass, you may believe that I am he. So he said that he knew that there was somebody in their midst that was going to betray them and that there was somebody else in their midst that was going to deny them. And he knew that all of them were going to forsake him when he was taken into custody. So he, did you notice, he says, I know whom I have chosen. When Christ chooses somebody, he knows them. I'm t telling you this morning that he knows everything about you. He knows the number of hair that is on your head. He knows uh, your favorite color. He knows your deepest, darkest secret. He knows everything about you. He says, right there, who I choose, I know. Amen. And I believe it was important as Jesus was telling his disciples here that he was explaining to them, he says, don't be surprised by this thing that's about to happen because I know what's coming. He wanted them to know that he was who he said he was and that after it came to pass, they would see that he was correct by telling them that this was coming. He's not surprised by your lack of faithfulness. He's not surprised by your slackness. He's not surprised by the sin that you just committed. He's not surprised about the fight you just had with your spouse before you came into church. I'm just being real with you. He's not surprised about these things because he knows you. He knows you by name. As billions and all the people that are on this earth, he knows every single one. He's such a great big God and so powerful that he can know each and every one of us individually in a way that we can't comprehend. And he wants to have a relationship with each one of us. Hallelujah to God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. He just wants to clean you up. He wants to show you how to act. He wants to show you how to be because he's coming back after a church that's without spot, that's without blemish. That's why that I'm not so turned away by conviction preaching. That's why I'm not so turned away when the Lord begins to deal with me because I know that he's just trying to clean me up. I know he's not doing it to, be, to make me feel bad or to embarrass me or anything like that because I accept it because I know he's trying to clean me up to help me get heaven. Amen. Because you're not going to get there with a spot or blemish. No sin will enter heaven. No sin will enter heaven. But here we read about what was about to take place. And in, in this culture, the code of hospitality and a shared table with somebody meant that if the one who ate bread with the other and afterward they lifted up their heel against them, that was known as great betrayal and treachery. He told them, he said that, that somebody was going to raise up their heel against him. That somebody was going to betray him. But I believe Jesus told them this so that they could remain confident in him. 
so that they would not go through this and say, well, Jesus was caught off guard. No, Jesus told them that what was about to happen. Verse 20, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. I believe he brought this in right here before it changes of what they were doing to reiterate the work of Christ that would continue long after he was gone physically and that he would also be an example for Judas that as he rejected Jesus, that it also meant rejecting God. When we reject the minister of God that preaches something that doesn't set well with you and you reject it, you're rejecting God. If it come from heaven and it's a message that abides with that word of the God, we better accept it because how we respond and what we do with it, we're going to give an account for. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. But if we receive it, that means that we're receiving not only Jesus, but we're receiving God and everything that they are a part of. Praise the Lord. Eddie, would you and a few musicians come back up to the piano this morning, please? I'm going to go to one more place, Mark chapter 16, but I want them to come and I just want them to play something softly. I know you've got good food and everything in the back. I'm not trying to hold you long, but I'm just trying to, to minister to you and love on you this morning. Mark 16, I'm going to read a few verses here. I didn't want to preach to you on Easter and not share something about the risen Savior. I know I preached on being a humble servant, and that's where I felt like the Lord was really leading me, but I also want to share about how that tomb is empty. Amen. Praise God. Verse 1, it says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mark 16, verse 1, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, Who shall roll, roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? So it sounds like that they're trying to figure out how they're going to get in there to Jesus, that they weren't expecting him to be risen or the stone to be rolled away. They expected him to be in the same position that they laid him and when they buried him. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrightened. And he saith unto them, Be not affrightened. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. He said, Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. Did you notice the verbs and the words that they used there? That he was, but now he's risen. He said, he's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. And he said unto you, and they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. In another book, here in the Gospels, one said it like this, Why seek ye the living among the dead? It's already been mentioned here this morning. And I really like that. It said, Why do you seek somebody who's living here where they lay dead men? Because they were going and, and they wanted to pay their respects to Jesus. They wanted to honor him and give him a proper burial and they were going to anoint him with sweet spices and do these things. They bought this on a Saturday even as the Sabbath day ended and they were going to go but Sunday morning was the first time that they had enough light to do this. And when they went, Matt, that they, they weren't expecting for there to be any change because they said something, who is going to roll away this great big stone? How are we going to get in there? They expected him to be in the same place, but when they came and they seen that the stone was rolled away, they began to question, they began to wonder, they began to think. And it said that they seen a young man sitting on the right side clothed in a long white garment and they were affrightened. This angel was there to confirm what it was that they were seeing. And he said, be not afraid or be not affrightened. Ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He's risen, he is not here. But what I really like about this, the angel should have and would have been enough for them to say, Jesus isn't here but he's risen. But notice what he said to them. He says, behold the place where they laid him. In other words, look for yourselves and see that Jesus is no longer here. I'm grateful that Jesus will allow us to not only be told something, but he will allow us to actually see it for ourselves sometimes, to help us believe, to help us understand that what we are seeing 
is true and is real. The stone was rolled away, not because Jesus had to have a way to get through that, because he could have and would have walked and did walk right through that stone. But they rolled it away so that others could see that he was there and he said he, he was risen like he said he would be. Jesus loves you this morning. I love you this morning. He's risen. He's not here. Today we celebrate and worship our Heavenly Father for sending His only begotten Son to die that old, on that old rugged cross and die a death that was painful and tough. And we worship Him because He's not dead any longer. That He died on that cross and rose again on the third day, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. If you and I accept that this morning and accept Him and ask Him to come into our heart, and believe what this word tells us and believe and take this word as it is, which is the truth. He says, I hold this word above my own name. So everything found in this scripture is true and correct. As they sing, I want to give you an opportunity. I want you to come. You can stay where you're at or you can come to this altar. I want to open up the altar this morning and ask if you're here and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, would you want to come and pray?